Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. We're doing our library update for May 1st, 2023 today, and this is where we're talking about all of the board games that came into the library during the month of April. These are board games, expansions, upgrades, promos, things like that, as well as all of the pre-orders that we made during the month of April. If you have any questions about the games that I'm talking about here, let me know down in the comments below, as well as I have links to everything in the description so that you can go get these for yourself if there's something that interests you. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure that you do. It is the best way to help us grow. And for those of you already subscribed, thank you so much for the continuous support. Let's talk about all the board games that entered during the month of April 2023. We'll start off with our first section, which is all of the new arrivals. And our first new arrival is Quirky Circuits. This is a programming game where you're going to be playing cards face down into a command line, and then everybody will reveal these cards. Now here's the twist. When you put them face down, you're not allowed to communicate outside of saying beep boop. So then you'll put all your cards down, you need at least five, everybody's got to play at least one, then you flip them, and then the robot that you're all controlling together with these cards moves around and tries to complete the objective. It'll scoot around and you'll try to coordinate based on the backs of the cards, which do have iconography that will help you predict what's going on, whether or not you're actually going to be playing a card when you're playing it and trying to anticipate what your teammates are doing. There's a set amount of cards in each of these robots' decks. They all do things a little bit differently so you can anticipate what the objectives you're chasing, what cards lead to what. It's a cool experience experience. It's one that I've been looking forward to playing for a long time. I like games like Mechs vs. Minions and The Mine, and so seeing this combination of these two ideas together, and it works so well. One of my favorite things about this game is the book itself. You simply open up the page, it has a map, the objectives on the other side, and then you put some tokens on there with the robot, shuffle up the deck, and you're ready to play. It takes less than a minute for a setup. This is one of those games that you can open up, start playing, and just keep going, going, going. You're diving into it as you're getting the experience leveled up each time by adding small little new rules tweaks and you can definitely just ramp up the difficulty as much as you like by going into more complex scenarios early very impressed with this one that is quirky circuits the next game here is the reprint of raw this is a gigantic fancy edition the deluxe edition that has these gigantic wooden tokens that you're going to be using for the tiles that you're pulling from this bag, as well as these chunky metal coins, with all with this art that's done by Ian O'Toole for this classic Ryder Canincia design. Now, I'd never played Raw before trying out this edition, but my friend Dan over at Chairman of the Board said, Mackenzie, you gotta, gotta give this one a try, because it is one of the best games out there. And I think that Dan is totally right here. This has been one of the most satisfying experiences I've had in a while, and it's a it's a definitely one that I'm so happy where we have in our library because I think it is so easy to pull out the bag, put it on the table, deal out the the tiles to everybody, the, your bidding tokens, and then start playing. It's easy to explain, and the iconography and the new graphic design makes it just that much more interesting. I looked at some of the old stuff, and it has this muted colored palette, and the player boards didn't seem as helpful to me when I was looking at it. So seeing this new graphic design, as well as the artwork, I think works perfectly, and it makes this Egyptian theme really shine while moving away from this dry, dusty, deserty look that a lot of these Egyptian games have. Now, the game itself is this auctioning game where on your turn you're either pulling a tile to put out in this auction row, starting an auction, or using a special power on one of the tiles. And so that's it. You have very limited options, but the timing of each of those options is huge. And that's what the balance of the game is about. Knowing when to bid for things, knowing when to take things, knowing when's the right moment to pull versus starting an auction, forcing other people to do things. There's so much interaction in this and understanding this push and pull of the different chips. I love the entire experience of this, and I think this package is well-deserved. The Deluxe Edition is well-earned in this case. So I'm really excited to play more Raw. It's one that we just keep pulling out because it's so easy to play, but also has that depth of decision-making within. Raw, that's an amazing game. That is Raw. Next up is Legendary, the Infinity Saga. So this introduces the Endgame as well as Infinity War Marvel Cinematic Universe cards into Marvel Legendary, the deck-building game. It's going to add some new keywords in particular, the sacrifice keyword, which is aptly named because there's a lot of people in this one that sacrifice themselves because of the whole Infinity Gauntlet being having requirements of people getting sacrificed. <laughs> so the keyword itself, what it does is you can get rid of that card. You can KO it to get an additional effect of some sort. For example, if you sacrifice um, Vision here for his let go card, you get to draw three cards and KO a card from a hand or discard. It's an amazing effect, but then you permanently lose that ability. I actually really like this ability of sacrifice because if you do this, you can strategically time when you do this. And it's awesome because most of the sacrifice cards have the purchasing power. So the way the game works 
resources you're generating in purchasing power or attack power, and you need the attack power to kill the final boss usually. And the purchasing power is used to add new cards to your deck. So most of these purchasing cards have the sacrifice keyword, which means that you're able to buy a bunch of heroes, then sacrifice them, getting them out of your deck, meaning that your deck is full of these strikes for the later portion of the game, which I love. I think that's a really smart design space as your deck is leveling up and you get to decide when it does. Next, the other keyword that it adds was the end game keyword. And this means that when you're in the bottom eight cards per player of the encounter deck. So there's this villain deck that you're going through. And once you get about halfway through it, then you are now in the end game. And this is so cool because the villains level up, but your cards can also level up. For example, you have Captain Marvel here who has cards that say end game. Hey, this no longer produces stars. It produces strikes as we were talking about before that can lead you to actually making resources that can actually deal with threats on the board. And then her ultimate card I was lucky enough to grab in one of the games just gives you plus two for each of a specific symbol instead of the plus one if it wasn't endgame. And then there are even some cards that can have your cards pretend like it's endgame for the turn. There's some cool interactions here, and I think that it's another awesome scaling mechanism that works well in the Legendary system. So that is Legendary, the Infinity Saga. Next up is a very interesting game that I don't think many people have heard of, and I don't think it's even on BGG because it is a technically an RPG. So this is a dialogue dialect, a game about language and how it dies. I was introduced to this by my friends, the Fowlers, Natalie and Levi. They brought this out because my, Natalie is actually one of my co-workers that's in English as a second language teacher with me. So we're very into linguistics. And this game stuck out because it's about language and how it changes as well as how it dies out. Essentially, your prompt is going to give you a community. And this community has story, legacy, and voice cards. And as you play, you're going to start introducing vocabulary to this world and you see how it changes how it's introduced, and based on how you are moving through your story that you're creating in this single session, then you are going to see how it actually transitions out and how the language completely changes into something new. I love this entire concept, and I like that it is that one single shot mission that has these great prompts. The entire package is gorgeous and beautiful. You have this book that's going to guide you through most of your interactions, and I think that the, the package here is something that if you are interested in linguistics or in just role playing and maybe thought that language as a basic basis for this foundational storytelling. I think that this is one that you need to check out that is dialect and it makes sense why it's won all of these awards, game of the year, best game tabletop, best game, silver any, I don't know a lot of these, but I definitely think it deserves some accolades and I was surprised when I was looking for this. I was like, I really want to play this game, but I didn't actually own it. So now we have a copy here in our library so I can show it to so many other people. So that is dialect, a game about how language, about language and how it dies. Next is Kites and this was shown to me by my friend Priscilla and Kyle, and this is a cooperative game that involves sand timers. The gameplay is quite simple. On your turn, you are playing a card from your hand, and that determines which sand timer that you flip. Each of the sand timers has a different amount of sand in it, and if ever any one of those sand timers runs out, you lose. So you're trying to get through this whole deck of cards and your hand before all of the sand timers run out. So you're going in turn order clockwise, playing cards, and everybody is communicating, talking, because you're trying to communicate which symbols you have so that you can actually change the sand timers but you have that ultimate decision in your hand what you're waiting for when you're going to time it because if you let the sand almost get to the end and you flip it it's going to have even more time when you actually flip it on the other side this reminds me a lot of the sand timer manipulation in magic maze but put into a package that makes sense has you making decisions all of the time and that's the thing that is the hallmark of a great real-time strategy game for me because you are actually making a decision every turn with the cards in your hand and you're having to do it on the fly while still figuring out how long you're willing to allocate towards that decision making. And the cherry on top with this game is it comes with all of these little expansion modules that are going to give you small extra challenges that you can shuffle into your deck, making the deck bigger and making these hidden events happen. I want you to explore them because I do think they're awesome, but once you beat that core game, you'll have ways to spice up your game. And honestly, I want to play more kites. I enjoy this one a lot and I hope that it gets more love as well as more expansion content in the future as I think those little modules are so much fun exploring the different mechanisms of available with this sand timer flipping experience. So kites, I was blown away with this. That is, yeah, that's kites. Excellent game. Next up, we have Monikers Classic. This is a very simple one. It's just more cards for Monikers. It's a combination of, I think, four different expansions into one. And the reason I like the Monikers version of this game, as opposed to just getting the normal fishbowl, etc., is the cards are so chock full of information 
usually. <laughs> they can be pretty comical when it comes to pictures, pooping before you weigh yourself, every little bit helps, cracks me up. But otherwise, you may have something that you have no idea who it is. Uh, for example, maybe you're not a Game of Thrones fan, Cersei Lannister here, maybe that's yeah, that blurb is going to actually get you something that can help you explain what's going to happen. So I really enjoy the entire layout of these moniker cards, and so that's why I had to make sure I got at least one expansion because we are running through our copy pretty quickly. Next up, we have Earth. This is one of the hottest games out right now, and for good reason. It reminds me a lot of Wingspan mixed with Glory to Rome, actually, as the game itself has you drawing cards at an alarming rate, as most of the actions, and there will be four that you'll be picking from every turn, you are going to either be drawing cards, playing those cards, gaining resources to play more cards, or generating resources on the cards that you've already played. It's a tableau builder at its heart, where you're trying to put things in a sequence in a specific order to score extra points, gaining new abilities, and most cards are going to have ways that they store resources resources that score extra points or provide additional effects for one of those four action phases. On your turn, you pick a phase, you do that action at a stronger ability, very similar to something like Puerto Rico or Race for the Galaxy. You get the effect, everybody else takes a weaker version of it, but everybody who has cards that triggers during that phase gets some ability. It's actually extremely clean on how it's done because you start from the top left and go to the bottom right. So you're going down this line of command actions and doing all of them. And it's great because you don't miss anything. You know exactly where you are. You never have to go back and repeat, but that means the placement of your cards is pretty dang important. You're drawing so many cards at all times that there's even a mechanism in the game where you can take cards in your hand and compost them and put them in a scoring pile. So yes, you're not using them right away and you're always having to make the decision of, do I actually want to play this card or is it worth better if I just keep it as a points? Because that can be another cost that you pay for the ability of another card. And one of my favorite things about this game are the event cards, which is another type of card that you can play at any time on any player's turn. So there's no interruption or anything like that. You do this and it's a additional cost of some sort. Maybe you're paying one resource to get another resource, but then it goes into this event pile, which sometimes will have negative points associated to it. So it's an opportunity cost of losing points later, but also losing some resource to do something now. It's so cool because it can make plays happen that normally shouldn't play. And there are even some abilities and effects that interact with the event cards. So it might be a strategy that you're leaning more towards completing. I enjoy this one a lot and I can see myself playing this a lot more. The solo mode also is surprisingly great. I thought it was a little scary at first because if you only had like 16 turns or eight turns, something like that, a really small amount of turns, but you get to play that whole game and feel yourself ramp up as you're racing against the clock while also actually making actual progression on your board. Impressed with the entire player count of these all the way up to the four player count here. That is Earth. Next up, we have Poetry for Neanderthals, the expansion. This is just a more cards box. Another really simple one comes with more cards for Poetry for Neanderthals. This is another one we've been running through like crazy, played with all the cards in the base game. And the cards themselves are super smart. It's a push your luck mechanism tied into the clue giving system because each of the cards has two words and the first word is an easier version and the second one adds something else and so when you're giving clues you can decide to stop after somebody gets that first card or you can keep going and try to get the one that's worth three times the amount of points so do you go for the one or do you go for the three do you have them as soon as you guess tier if they're having trouble with that do you drop it and score keep going or do you try to lean in and get that extra point i love it this is such a great system and I, i'm happy that we have more cards that just means that we can play more of it heck yes and i love that the rules are on the side of the box here use these cards to play more. Next up is Darwin's Journey. This has been one of my hits, as you can see back here. It's long awaited for sure. One of the oldest outstanding Kickstarters that we have had, but it finally arrived and it delivered. Thank goodness. This design team, Simone Luciani and Nestor Mangone, have brought us a combo building game that focuses around worker placement and upgrading your workers through seals. So every turn you're putting out workers, moving along different tracks, and these tracks have icons that allow you to gain additional bonus actions, different ways of scoring resources that you can utilize in the other action spaces. And it's a gratifying system as you are constantly gaining new powers, abilities, completing objectives, which unlock new passive effects, allowing you to move up different tracks, scoring for objectives. And then there's these 
end of round objectives that tie it all together that are giving you direction throughout your entire experience. I love the competition on the different islands, the first come first serve, the way the different tracks work, as well as how you're interacting with each other, leapfrogging one another on them. In addition, we've had a chance to play the expansion, so a lot of the modules as well as the Fireland expansion, and I've been pretty impressed with this as well. The Fireland expansion adds a brand new board to the game, so not a main game board, but a new map board. And the way it works is you now have, instead of just two separate tracks in the main game where you had three islands that were tied to each other based on the boat, the more you got your boat, the more islands you could explore, which makes sense. This one offers not only the ability to get new islands through moving your boat, but also if you are moving through the islands enough, you find new bodies of water, which means that if you go up a certain route, you're also able to unlock new boat actions. So you're able to have all of these different spots that you're exploring. It means that you can invest in different types of tracks in order to get your own bonuses and have an area that's just yours. So I love the different options that are present and how everything is tied even more so to each other. Uh, this version also includes this time mechanism, which has you paying a additional cost. And the, the further, the more time you pay, the more penalties you get for your entire experience. But this time cost payment gives you access to some incredible boons, whether it be an additional research of some sort, giving you these instant points right away or extra cash that you never thought you'd have. It allows you to open up your gameplay, but then it's really hard to actually get back from that. So these time tiles will give you negative negatives if you're further enough down, if you spent enough time. And so you're trying to manage how much time you're actually spending because you don't want to incur all those penalties because it is going to set you back quite a bit. One of the penalties we had where if you had enough time spent, you actually were going to reduce the amount that you got to move your boat each time by one. It was awful. So my friend Robert was playing this with me and he had, he was down on his ship in this area near maybe the center of the board here. And he just couldn't get past it because he was stuck in that time zone down at the bottom. It was so interesting because I had done this play where I did one gigantic jump with my boat and then got my time super far down so that I could pretty much ignore it for the rest of the game. I didn't need to move my boat down the main body section and I could crawl along the rest of the smaller tracks. It's so interesting. Now, it definitely is a lot to take in. There's a lot of choices. There's explorations. There's tokens everywhere, different bonuses. It's kind of insane the amount of icons that are there. But after you play the base game once, probably once, I think once, honestly, you'll be able to understand the symbology because there's just more of it in different places and then see how they work together and interact. It's pretty dang smart, this design, and it's gratifying. I love the upgrading action spaces. I like that your workers get stronger. You can choose to invest in them or you can decide to take early actions quickly and just try to get a bunch of smaller actions. And I like the choice when it comes to all of the different expansion content as I think it's all really solid. Haven't played an expansion that I have disliked. This is the last one that we haven't played with and that is the uh, pirate expansion, which adds a new ship that's actually going to go around the board and you can have it attack other players. That sounds kind of funny. I'm looking forward to trying that one though. So that is the expansions for Darwin's Journey and Darwin's Journey overall worth the wait. Absolutely loving this one. I'm excited to play more of it, honestly. Next, we have a small filler game. This is Vegetable Stock. This has also been a huge hit. It's been a pretty great month. And Vegetable Stock is a small filler game that can be explained as get the most money. On your turn, you take a card. Whatever card's left over in the area, that moves these stocks up at the top. If they ever make it all the way to the top, they bust and set to zero. You have six turns to do this. Whoever has the most money wins. Love this. It is takes less than five minutes to play. Even it takes less time to score. Thank goodness it doesn't have that fantasy realms effect. But this is one that is engaging, exciting, and has players communicating and trying to finagle onto who is going to be pushing up what values. It's definitely a game where you can sit there and crunch the numbers and completely figure out what all the values are. And then you can take it like that. But the experience experiences that I've had is people are taking their information at face value and making the best decision that way while getting input from others. I love this game. I think it's so much fun. And this is one of those games like Coloretto where I think to myself, how did I not invent this? Because it's so simple, but brilliant. And I think it takes this stock mechanism and puts it into an approachable way. And I think it's appropriate for all ages while still being fun and having great decisions for all ages. I can see myself playing a lot more of this. And there are also these cute little expansions that come with the copy that give you extra ways to either restrict the amount of busting that going on that's going on and let you do some more risky plays or increases the amount of change that happens with the market as well. So get the vegetable stock copy of this kind. And it also comes with those promo cards included. So that's vegetable stock. Next up, we 
have Time Stories Revolution Cavendish. And this is the game I was the most worried about because of my experience with the last Time Stories. Now, the Midsummer's Night, the last expansion, was the worst Time Stories expansion, which was so wild to me because the entire Blue Box series has been up and down. I think Hadal Project, the first one in this Blue Box series, was one of the best Time Stories out there. I love the twists and turns. I'm not going to talk about it right now because that's it's spoilers galore, and this is a game that you experience. And But the second one was awful. Skip it. It's bad. Don't play it, period. I think it's the worst experience. I think I put a review on it on the BGG page for the Midsummer's Night. But Time Stories Revolution Cavendish was a the concept of a haunted house. Think Betrayal at House on the Hill or Mansions of Madness meets Time Stories, the time traveling game. And I'm happy to say that this one is much better than the last one. I was engrossed. I was excited. I was playing the entire time and enjoying myself. I'm going to tell you that the ending, go into the ending knowing that there is one layer to the boss fight. So keep that in mind as you're playing because that was that made it a little bit of a letdown for almost everybody at the table without getting into any spoilers that there was there's only one layer to that boss fight. So keep that in mind. Um, so that's Go into the game thinking that when you're ready, but enjoy the experience because this is one of the cool ones. I love the interactions, and this adds a great mechanism with the fear mechanism. It's in the rule books, no spoiler, but a fear mechanism where you're going to be collecting these fear tokens as you play, and then it also has this carryover from the previous expansions with your own special reactions, and I love this. You have this deck of cards that are just for you that every time something says, hey, read your interaction card 13, that's going to be different based on who's actually interacting with it, meaning that your experience with this Time Stories Revolution game, Cavendish, is going to be different than others based on who is taking what card, what decisions you're making at every single branching path. I love this, and I think it's so much fun, and I think that this one is a great return to form while not having any of the meandering, pointlessness, and convolution that the last one had. So enjoy Cavendish a lot. Just keep that last part in mind about that single layer to that final boss battle. So that is Time Stories Cavendish. Next up, we have Grove, a nine card solitaire game. This is a new version of Orchard, which runs on the same system. You're going to be playing cards on top of each other, trying to match the colors exactly. And when you do, you add up the amounts of fruits to generate these dice on top. This one adds some new mechanisms, though, where you're able to get additional multipliers if you're able to get those dice all the way up to the largest numbers, getting even a wheelbarrow, which is a crazy amount of points. And it also introduces this dropping mechanism where you can cover a card with an empty grove and that leaves the fruit in a field, which means that you can actually switch cards in between these groves, pick them back up, and then place a new plant on top. And so you're able to add those dice back. So I like that it gives you some freedom and flexibility with those grove cards when you're actually placing things on top of each other. It did make a couple of changes with the original rules, uh, adding a squirrel in place of the two, I think it was rotten fruit tokens that came in the original, and then also adding new extra expansions that give you these objective cards that are printed on the back. Think something like the Button Shy games with uh, Sprawlopolis, how each card is different on both sides with objectives on one and then the actual cards on the other. So I love that these have added some new evolutions to the gameplay and extra expansions, but still not one that I find myself pulling out a lot for the solo play. Uh, similar, sitting in that same rating as Orchard where I don't know how often I'm going to return to this, but maybe I'll give it a couple more tries and some more tries with the expansion as well. So that is Grove. And our last game in our new arrivals is the Isofarian Guard. This is another one of our long-awaited games up there with Darwin's Journey, even older actually, but a completely different beast as you are playing this large campaign game with a huge narrative aspect. There's a foreteller narration for it, one of my favorite things. I love that you can attach these voices to the faces. You have it on in the background so you're able to focus on the thematics and understanding what's happening. I love having the reading there as well because you can listen and read along so you're making sure to get everything. You're not missing anything. I love the entire pro the product here as well as the sound effects that they add in and the different voice actors are great. So the foretelling narration is wonderful for this. The game itself has you traveling on this gigantic map from node to node. Right now I am one chapter in, so that is something to be aware of. I'm in the middle of the second chapter right now, and you'll be controlling up to two characters. In the first chapter, you're controlling mainly one, and then you eventually will get two, and that's going to be the norm for the rest of the game as you have these two characters at your helm. So those characters are going to be filling up a bag with chips, and then based on the interaction points on the node, you are either going to like visit a town, shop, get things, spend your money, get new equipment, or you're going to do a random 
event. It does take a while to get those random events. That is one of my dings. It takes about three encounters to actually get a random event, and there's not a very big likelihood of actually doing one of those events, so it takes a while to get those. But the main thing that's going to happen is you're going to draw one of these skull tokens, which has you doing a fight. And when you start a fight, you're going to have your bag that's prepped full of these chips, and you'll be drawing chips based on your cubes on your like action area over here where this cube section is. You'll draw chips based on that, and then use these chips as well as those action cubes to activate the different cards in front of you. Based on the order that you activate them, you'll get to unlock special abilities and powers, but each character is different in how their different abilities work. We have one that's more of a defensive character or and also a very aggressive character who's able to combo their chips in order to gain gigantic turns, able to allocate a bunch of chips and include these green chips in their bag so whenever they draw it, it doesn't count as their hand size, so they can keep on drawing more, having these gigantic turns. Where the other one is a potion maker, they're able to mix and match these different buffs, and so they work really well together as one is able to be a support role, while the other one is actually focusing on dealing that big damage, but they're also really flexible in how they can switch back and forth within those roles. And some cool stuff going on here. On top of the combat itself, you'll have these different skill trees that you're able to spend the experience points that you're gaining, getting new chips that are permanently added to your bag, new stat buffs, as well as new cards that will go in front of you. One of the main mechanisms of this game is there are cards that offer you ways to actually spend your chips in combat. So if you have access to all of these cards, then you're able to actually allocate and have way more different choices on where you're putting your different things. And most of these cards also feature the ability to flip them over once they've been placed on, giving you new powers and new abilities and lots of timing things to actually consider when you're putting out these combos. Now, so far, I think that this gameplay loop is something that I do enjoy. I do find uh, managing two characters a little challenging sometimes in the solo mode as it feels like you're doing a lot in order to get through one of the encounters and you're doing a lot of encounters so if you enjoy the encounter system it's going to be one that you like and i think that the narrative storytelling is wonderful i just wish there was more of it at this point that i'm in right now right now i'm in the area where i am just traveling around the map right now working my way towards one of these areas but it's taking a long time to do so as i keep on running into these combats now the combats are getting to a bit of a repetitive point with these two characters because it is taking a while to actually unlock new cards and the characters that I am fighting are pretty similar. They have these profiles here that will give them their attack, their defense, their actions, as well as their health points. And based on where you are on the map, as well as what chapter you're in, that dictates the characters that you're actually going to be fighting at what level. So I do like the AI system. I think it works really well, but I am finding that my play patterns with the heroes are the things that I am repeating because I am doing sort of the most efficient thing for my characters that I have and the things that I have unlocked currently so I am falling into this repetitive play pattern with them unfortunately I'll give this one some more time for sure seeing if that gameplay loop does open up more with the addition of new cards which I'm hoping it does because I do think there's a lot to love in this system and there's a lot more characters to discover as well so looking forward to trying out the new unique strategies there and seeing about the different combinations of characters you can potentially make we'll see where the story takes us so that is the Isofarian guard and that's all of the new arrivals let's move on to all of our upgrades starting off with the Marvel Champions store kit. So this is essentially a kit that was meant to actually be played in a open setting where you're bringing people to your store, but I found it displayed at one of my local game stores here at J&J Games, and I saw it on the shelf being sold for 25 bucks, so I picked this one up, having no idea what the contents were, and then brought it back. I even did a live unboxing here on the channel, and just to see what it was, and this was actually quite a cool one, as it had a bunch of promo cards for the game, as well as new health dials and wheels. This was actually great, because I have been playing this game for a while, so my wheels were getting a little dingy because they're being used so much, and so I have these new X-Men themed ones. In addition, you also have these new alternate art characters, and that is the highlight. You have these random drop packs that have alternate art characters for all of the different heroes from the X-Men cycle. This includes from Kitty Pride and Peter Rasputin, all the way up to Wolverine and Storm. Actually, it's all the way up to Gambit and Rogue, because it had their um, Bride and Groom cards in there as well. So we were able to get an entire set of it, as well as some others. So looking forward to playing more with these cards. And some of the alternate arts are just amazing. I think some of my standouts, I really love the Cyclops artwork. I love the full artwork of the Shadowcat, where you can see the full Sentinel in the background. That's pretty incredible. 
incredible. And then the Logan artwork, I think, is great with the upgrade, updated Logan artwork, that full art there. Amazing. And then lastly, the Rogue artwork is pretty stunning. So I love both sides of that and the evolution of this more serious tone. And then you can even put the Anna Marie and Remy LeBeau character cards together to make that full artwork. It's pretty cool. So those are the Marvel Champions Mutant Genesis store packs with the promos. The next promos we got were for Vagrant Song, and this was the DC plushie. Corin got to play with the plushie, so she was super excited to get that. And then we got the three exclusive junk cards and just put them back into our deck. There's some new items that you can get, just adding some more variability to the game. Uh, Vagrant Song is one of my favorite campaign games out there, so I'm happy to get some more content for it, whether it be three promo cards or an entire expansion. I'm all game. And then our last promo is for terror birds for paleo this is a small additional set of cards that you can throw into your paleo games to change up the variability it's pretty simple because you're usually playing one mission paired with some modular cards think something like a modular deck system or something like marvel champions where you're picking modular encounter sets this is very similar in that vein and the terror birds gives you new ways to play so i love this this is just extra variability for the game and new things to explore the entire paleo system is really well done with the way that you're combining the cards and not sure what you're actually exploring for. Love the exploration mechanism in this one. And our last upgrade is not really a component upgrade or anything like that. This is a side game LLC game night hosting upgrade. These are the M68 portable speakers. So we have a game of Blood on the Clock Tower that we're going to be running in May. And so picked up a speaker here. That way we can play some mood music. It's tiny, small, inconspicuous. And I think that it's going to work great. So I've already tested it. The sound quality works just fine. And I hope that this is going to add some great ambiance to our game of Blood on the clock tower we get to play it in this large mansion and it's going to be perfect mood setting i'm really looking forward to this getting to teach some blood in the clock tower to some folks that have not tried it before so looking forward to it that is the m68 portable speaker yeah excited to play some creepy music with it. So those are all of the upgrades. Let's go ahead and move on to the pre-orders. So we have three different pre-orders for this month, starting off with Guards of Atlantis 2, the tabletop MOBA. This is one of my new favorite games of all time. It's a team-based MOBA style game where you're going to be taking your group of champions versus your opponents and fighting for either complete dominance of their heroes, reducing their life to zero, or pushing your minions along to destroy their base. Now this is a reprint campaign, so you can get it if you missed it on the first time, and I do recommend that you give it a try if you're ever going to have a game night with four or more people. It's no luck, super cutthroat, but it's a game that I find extremely rewarding as you are communicating between your team and trying to make everything work perfectly. You have these unique champions that have their own sets of action cards, and my gosh, they're all different and interesting. I did an entire ranking list on the channel talking about all of the different characters, my recommendations for which expansions from this to pick up, and honestly, if just to boil it down, I think you should really just go all in on this thing. It's one of my favorite games to play in a long while. You can actually get it now without paying a ridiculous amount in the aftermarket, which is what we did because I really wanted to give it a try before I picked up more content for it, but I am loving it so far. And this is going to have completely updated um, card text, so they did have some problems with some of the cards earlier, so they are doing a reprint for that for the changes from the first edition. They're going to be changing up the insert as well, and then you'll have the entire roster of characters at your disposal as well. So you have your base game, Devoted, Defiant, and then we are having two entirely new hero packs with the Wayward hero pack. We got Bryn, Mortimer, Takahide, Widget, Emmett, as well as the Arcane hero pack. Ooh, they just uh, announced a new one. Snorri, I hope it's a dwarf. Gideon, Mrak, Rowena, and we have one less, Razzle. I am looking forward to this. And this also introduces, introduces Gideon, the first four-star difficulty character. I'm still having a blast playing all of the heroes at our disposal right now, but when these two new hero sets arrive, I will be thrilled. So that is Guards of Atlantis 2, our first pre-order. Our next pre-order is for the AR Vault Story Dice. Now this is bid as a set of high quality RPG components, mainly dice trays, dice containers, as well as the super fancy RPG dice. So is that something you're interested in? That might be worth checking out, but we're mainly going to be going for it for these Upgrade Your Awaken Realms games projects. So what it is, is a set of dice that are specifically for pre-existing projects for Awaken Realms. These are things like Etherfields, as well as Nemesis, 
Nemesis and ISS Vanguard. There's even some for Tainted Grail as well. So you can go in on that instead of going for the RPG dice, which is what we're doing. Now, these are going to give you small mini expansions, and based on the promo mini expansions that they've released before for these games, I'm all in. I love the tiny little rules that they add, more things to explore and do, and I especially love the objective cards and additional action cards for Nemesis. So I'm looking forward to seeing what these little promos are going to do for this game, and the dice are stunning. You can also get them sun drop, the quality is excellent, and if you do enjoy the RPG style instead, they've got lots of options for those dice as well. So that is something that you can explore, whether it be the sun dropped versions, the non sun drop, or these classic glass dice sets. So lots of choices when it comes to the AR vault story dice and our last pre-order goes to the project l reprint and new expansion now we are only going in for one of the new expansions as we have everything for project l right now and that is the phoenix expansion is the one we're looking forward to now, i do like project l a lot i love the openness the turn structure the engine building with these tetris pieces it's really satisfying to play overall and i love the expansions that add new tiles which is what phoenix is doing i'm not a big fan of the finesse expansion overall it gives you these objectives that you're going for and then they reward you with these extra credits from reactions yes definitely strong, but it more so guides your play style instead of letting you be open, which I enjoyed the ghost expansion here did, giving you just more options on the tiles that you were grabbing, as well as the pieces that you could collect. But the Phoenix expansion adds new tiles with just this gigantic point values, as well as making it so you do need to have the mixture of these giant and small pieces. So every piece that you've collected matters. It's also going to increase that player count to six, which means that you're going to be able to play this with just that many more people, or if you like playing with those smaller groups, which I do recommend it means less downtime that you're just going to have that much more variety so that's the phoenix expansion and i do believe we're also getting the larger insert for this as well so that is the phoenix expansion for project l and that's it those are all of the games the new arrivals the upgrades the pre-orders as well as speakers for the side game library for the month of april Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions about anything that you saw here, please let me know down in the comments below. And for links to everything that I talked about here, take a look in the description of the video. What games were added to your personal collection during the month of April? Which games are you excited that are coming in in May? And which games are you looking forward to playing and just maybe haven't gotten to yet? I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you so much for watching. Side Game Strong.